space is being invaded by very large swarms of very small satellites. It's sometimes referred to as space 2.0 or new space or really a space revolution. Within a decade, thousands of these low-cost cube satellites, CubeSats as they're known, will be deployed. <laughs> the amount of things you can do with those satellites is huge. They'll image every corner of the Earth every day, explore the Moon, Mars and asteroids, and help us understand the near-Earth atmosphere like never before. For the first time ever, anyone with a bright idea can launch it into orbit. It's going to be very disruptive to the established order. When you make something accessible to a larger community, then the richness of ideas for how they can be used explodes. Our space experts want to be part of that future, so they've joined a European-led project called QB50. It will shed light on a region of space we know little about and help us get a start in this new space race. It's not just scientific missions, they're going to be commercial applications, and there are lots of them out there waiting. Getting on board now is really, really quite important. It's been 14 years since a homegrown Australian satellite looked down on the Earth. But there's something new on the horizon. Three teams of Australian space engineers, led by the universities of New South Wales, Sydney and Adelaide, have built their own CubeSats. Each one is only about the size of a loaf of bread and weighs less than two kilograms. It's basically a full functioning satellite. It's got all the subsystems that a normal satellite has. It's just very, very small. And when they talk about a cube, it refers to unit cubes of 10 by 10 centimetres, essentially. So that's a one unit, and then that's the second unit. Early next year, the CubeSats will be deployed from the International Space Station. They'll be part of a constellation of 50 satellites orbiting within the thermosphere. The thermosphere is a layer of the atmosphere beginning about 90 kilometres above the Earth and stretching up to 1,000 kilometres into space. It expands and contracts with solar activity. The CubeSat's mission is to measure the composition of the thermosphere and the way it responds to space weather. Space weather is disruptions in space that can interfere or disable the satellites we rely on. That the thermosphere is basically what is dividing Earth from the Sun, most of the space weather phenomena happens exactly in that area. We see it in the auroras that light up the North and South Poles. But these are just a glimpse of the powerful hidden forces at play. So if you think about eruptions on the Sun, so we have these very fast particles, electric charged protons that are flying at hundreds of kilometers per second towards the Earth. This high energy radiation can temporarily scramble satellite systems or knock them out completely. The radiation heats and expands the gases within the thermosphere, creating drag forces that can be difficult to predict. It causes us to lose track of where satellites are, and then we have to search frantically with telescopes and radars to recover the locations of those satellites. And when the radiation tears electrons from the gas atoms, it creates electrically charged plasma. On Earth, we experience mostly three states of matter. We experience solids, liquids and gases. However, most of the visible universe is in the plasma state. The motion and the behaviour of this plasma is affected by the electric and magnetic fields of the Earth, Sun and solar wind. The complexity of the dynamics can be enormous, at least as rich as anything we experience in terrestrial weather. 
This space weather can affect the accuracy of the signals we receive from the GPS and other satellites, which we increasingly rely on. The US have done a study on 18 critical infrastructure sectors of the economy. Of those 18 critical infrastructure sectors, 15 rely on GPS timing, the other three rely on GPS positioning. So the whole economy sits on top of GPS. Most human beings are blissfully unaware of how important space weather has become to their lives. You know, you turn off the GPS system now and, it's, and our economy almost will fall apart. Well, the good news is we have no coronal mass ejections coming today. We need to be able to predict space weather, just as we predict the weather down here on Earth in the troposphere. But that's easier said than done. The prediction of space weather is at its infancy. Perhaps my learned colleagues will be upset if I say this, but our, our ignorance is, is infinite on this subject. If you compare our knowledge of the thermosphere with thus that of the troposphere, we can uh, safely say that we know almost nothing. That's because our forecasts for the troposphere rely on countless current and past observations, which we can't get in the thermosphere. Weather balloons don't go high enough, and research rockets spend only a couple of minutes up there, just a few times a year. And in low Earth orbit, large satellites aren't practical. There's too much atmospheric drag causing them to lose altitude. Who would want to spend $200 million, $300 million to put a satellite in the thermosphere when it's only going to burn up after six months, 12 months? With a cheap satellite, you can recruit it for a suicide mission where it's going to give you useful data, data that has never been collected before. The concept of a CubeSat was initially developed at Stanford and Cal Poly universities in the late 1990s. I knew that in order to get them launched, the smaller you can make them, the better off you would be. So I started looking around for something that was small, but I knew I had to have a cube. Over time, the unit size has become an accepted standard, with most satellites containing between one and six units. In the past five years, they've taken off as components have become increasingly smaller and cheaper. We've even seen CubeSats operating off mobile phones. PhoneSat is a technology demonstration. We're saying, you know, how cheaply can you actually build a satellite? So you have this phone that has an extraordinarily fast processor. It's got sensors, it's got magnetometers and gyros and a camera, and they're built to withstand people throwing them against the wall and so they can survive the launch environment. This miniaturization means there's more space inside to put more science in space. So this is our diagnostics. Not only do the Australian CubeSats contain a sensor for the QB50 mission, the researchers have also squeezed in their own technologies to test, such as a GPS and Earth observation sensors, and a computer system that aims to repair itself after a hit of radiation. This little craft has five instruments on it. That's unheard of. Um, year, even a year ago, you'd expect to have one instrument, perhaps, on a spacecraft. Each of these CubeSats costs between half and a million dollars to build, test and launch. That's small change compared to the cost of traditional satellites, which is hundreds of millions of dollars. To me, a CubeSat is a tool. It's a small device that you can build and, or buy partly, cheaply, easily. You can put novel capabilities into it. And so you're taking the emphasis away from the making of a spacecraft into something where what you're caring about is what you do with your, with your CubeSat. Ambitious companies, including startups, have jumped on board. They see CubeSats as a platform for innovation, just as the internet is. It's a big, big jump from having a small number of companies that are able to afford the hundreds of millions dollars of satellites and the low risk that they must take and therefore the slow rate of innovation that produces. You change that, you, you open that to the masses and the richness of ideas, the richness of applications, the, the innovation just accelerates. One company alone has already deployed more than 140 three-unit CubeSats, 
with hundreds more to come. The aim is to image every part of the Earth every day. Our imagery is really powerful because it allows us to uncover things like deforestation, agricultural change, monitoring geopolitical developments, analyzing shipping activity in ports. It's speculated that everyone from financial analysts tracking the output of mines to scientists monitoring the environment could find a use for such images. What's happening to the Great Barrier Reef? Can we actually extract information on whether the coral's healthy or whether it's in trouble? So there's a huge number of things that one can do with the data. It's also a radical shift towards disposable space technology, where cheap satellites in low Earth orbit lose altitude, burn up, and are replaced and updated every few years. But NASA also sees a role for high-tech CubeSats beyond low Earth orbit. They're offering rewards to make that happen. Part of the $5.5 million in prize money goes to the teams that successfully achieve a stable orbit around the moon. Doing so requires teams to successfully deliver solutions to challenges in navigation, propulsion, command, and control that are unique to satellites venturing beyond Earth orbit. In 2018, 13 CubeSats will be on top of NASA's first test flight of the new Space Launch System. The rocket that goes beyond the retired space shuttles. The onboard avionics box will command each dispenser to release the small satellites, sending each one on their way to deep space destinations such as the moon or an asteroid. Also in 2018, two CubeSats known as Marco A and B will hitch a ride on the next Mars lander, InSight. InSight will separate, and soon after, each of the Marco spacecraft will also separate from the rocket. During InSight's descent and landing, the CubeSats will relay information from it back to Earth. These spacecraft, the size of a briefcase, will be the first interplanetary CubeSats, paving the way for future small spacecraft exploration. CubeSats arguably are the way of the future. Australia hasn't built any CubeSats before, and Australia has not built any satellites at all for 15 years. So this is actually quite a big deal. I'm very much looking forward to the day of putting it in a box and <laughs> sent up to the space station, basically. You know, sort of three years of uh, a lot of work. The building, the testing, all of that's been done here in Australia. And to get that happening on a shoestring budget uh, is, has been incredibly difficult. But it is very rewarding. I mean, we're, we're almost there. The CubeSats will begin their mission in late December, when an Antares rocket will boost them 400 kilometers above the Earth to the International Space Station. The astronauts will take these satellites it will put them onto a robotic arm and will then eject them into space. Our CubeSats are meant to study the thermosphere and for that they need to travel down through the thermosphere. The satellites will spread around the Earth because each satellite is slightly different to the other. It will have slightly different orbital dynamics. So what they'll be flying through is very, very dilute gas and plasma. That's going to slow them down and then their orbit will start decaying. As they lose altitude over the course of about a year, they'll take millions of synchronized measurements of either oxygen, plasma, or the atomic composition of the atmosphere. Our sensors are high performance sensors. They have the potential to take way more measurements than has ever been taken uh, before. We have high expectations from the data. We know that this type of measurement, it's unique. And the type of science that will come out of it will be also unique. It really is groundbreaking. We will have a very different picture, I think, of the ionosphere and the thermosphere of Earth after QB50. We'll also be able to better predict the paths of satellites and the space junk that litters near Earth orbit. It will improve the quality of satellite signals and help deal with the dangers of space weather. And it may have already launched a new space industry in Australia. Once they get down to about 90 kilometers altitude, then they'll start burning up and our mission will be over. 
and burns up and evaporates and it's three years of work gone. It is a suicide mission, but uh, for a good cause. <laughs>